Come in, grab a seat, we're gonna start it. Welcome to One Love Church. I'm so glad we all get to be together this morning. I'm looking forward to see what God's going to do today. And before we get in the rest of the service, I have a few announcements for us. Uh, but really quick, uh, my name is Ben. And uh, if this is your first time, we hope you really feel and experience Christ today. Uh, and if you would like to talk more, I'm welcome to talk to Pastor Lana or myself after service. But again, welcome to everybody. Uh, so as far as announcements for us this morning... Uh, Winter Jam, a Christian concert series that is that goes around the nation. It's been going for many, many years, and they are coming to Knoxville tonight. So we have a group from our church going today. Our student ministry is going as well as many others, and we're excited to see what God's going to do. If very loud music is not your thing, definitely keep us in your prayers. Uh, the gospel is uh, just very clearly shared each and every time Winter Jam comes to Knoxville and the other cities as well. So we're excited to see what God is going to do through that. So definitely keep us in your prayers. Uh, the next announcement I have is March 1st and 2nd, New Horizon Baptist Church here on the other side of La Follette. They are doing their annual men's conference. And we have a group from One Love that is going to be attending that. If you're interested in, in uh, going to that conference, see me after service. Uh, they're looking for a loose number of folks that are coming so they can prepare the food. It's a free conference, free food. They have a free dinner Friday night and uh, breakfast Saturday morning. And every year that I've gone, it's been awesome. And God has used each and every conference to challenge me in my walk with him. And I know he will do the same for you. So if you're interested in that, again, see me after service and we'll get you signed up. Uh, the next announcement I have is Saturday, Fe February 24th from 2 to 6, 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. That's a Saturday. It's just a, another outreach event that One Love we are doing. It's just a, a, a game, game night. So board games, card games, uh, any kind of thing you can think of. It's just an event open for the community. So come on out for that. Bring, bring a friend, bring a guest. I'm sure we'll be having a good time. Uh, but uh, for those who are concerned, 
there's not going to be any gambling, so don't, you know, don't, don't throw your arms up over that, right? We're just going to have fun, so I'm just joking. Well, that's really all I have, so uh, before we get on the service, we're going to have a time of prayer. My dad's going to come up. He's going to pray for us this morning, and uh, we'll get on with our service. Thank you, guys. Let's pray. Father, thanks so much for just bringing us here this morning and just giving us a desire to be here, Father, with other believers. But I do pray that if somebody here doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I pray they would humble themselves, repent, and trust Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. We also thank so very much for all the other things going on in our community where have been announced that are, where the gospel is proclaimed, Father. Of course, you're thinking about the winter jam tonight. I pray that many would be there and give much safety as they they go to this event tonight. And I just pray many would get saved at that uh, event. Help us to lift those, uh, that event. Uh, many would show up at that event. Stand up, find someone you know, let's welcome each other, and then let's worship.
today. God, we pray that your spirit would be with us. God, that your word would affect us deep into our souls, God, that we would grow closer to you and grow wiser through it. God, be with us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Man, let's give those guys a hand, all of our volunteers today. <laughs> Thankful for them each and every week and uh, continue to pray for Maria. You try to make it a go today, right? And, and couldn't, but uh, I think you're seeing a, uh, a specialist Thursday. Is that right? Yeah. So let's uh, keep Maria in her, uh, in her prayers, please, this week. Um, we're thankful that you're here. Thankful for everybody watching online. I uh, had some friends reach out actually from Texas this morning, and uh, they were going to be watching. So I want to welcome uh, those guys as well. That's why I wore my Tennessee, right, to show them the, the true orange and the true tea uh, this morning. So uh, I like to remind them as much as I can, uh, there wouldn't be a Texas if it wasn't for Tennessee men, right? So... Um, I always like to hit them up, but hey, uh, we're glad you're here. Uh, we started a series last week called The Story of Samson, and we're looking at his life, and uh, we're going to pick up right where we left off last week, and that is in Judges chapter 14. Uh, we went through verses uh, 9 last week, so we'll pick up verse number 10. And um, really, uh, we've already learned, I think, from last week that uh, Samson's really a colorful character, right? Probably uh, maybe one of the most colorful of all the Bible. And uh, really, the story uh, of Samson, it's a tale about uh, the weak becoming strong, and yet the strong becoming weak. And um, today, we're going to look at spiritual breakdowns. Uh, spiritual breakdowns, what are they? And uh, how do they happen? And what are the consequences or effects that they have on our life? And uh, there's no greater example in the Bible than, uh, than Samson. So uh, we're going to pick up again in verse number 10. And we'll have the scriptures for you uh, on the screen as well. And this is what the Bible says. And his father, this is Samson's father, went down to the woman. And Samson prepared a feast there. For so the young men used to do. And as soon as the people saw him, they brought 30 companions to be with them. And uh, let, let's just stop right there for a moment. If you remember last week, Samson was kind of in the wrong place, the wrong spot where he had no business being. And while he's there, right, he happens to see this, this, this woman and he, he's just mesmerized by her, right? It's, it's love at first sight. He can't stop thinking about her. He has to have her. He goes back to his mom and dad and says, hey, I want this woman, right? His words, not mine. <laughs> That's exactly what he says. And they try to talk him out of it, right? They try to impart some wisdom. They're like, hey, this isn't such a good idea. You know, she don't worship the God that you do. You've set your life aside, dedicated to God. She doesn't even know who your God is. This is going to be problems, but he would not have it. And uh, he kept repeating. He's like, no, I have to have her. This is the woman that I want. And so here we are picking back up in verse number 10, and we see that uh, his father goes down. They've made um, uh, preparations, right? The parents have worked it out. Uh, they're going to get married. And so now we're coming down to what would typically be the, the, the wedding ceremony and the feast event. And uh, I titled this that bad company and bad decisions go hand in hand. Uh, and they usually do in life, right? And um, uh, Samson's going to set up. He's showing up here with his family. Uh, they're at the bride's uh, home place. And uh, it's going to be a week-long wedding ceremony and get-together. And um, the Philistines uh, were really renowned, right, for... Uh, both their production and consumption of alcohol, alcoholic beverages. And uh, in fact, even today, you can just Google it, right? But there's numerous of finds, ar archaeological finds, uh, that have exposed, really, they had a well-managed spirits industry, right? They had breweries, they had win wineries, you name it back then. Um, and among some of the most numerous artifacts that are typically pulled out uh, of the ruins are literally like beer 
beer mugs and, and what they called wine craters. It was these large bowls that they used for drinking wine. And the Philistines liked to party. Uh, in fact, they were known, right, for their uh, just r- really grotesque and, and debauchery that happened during these uh, uh, parties that they would have, even so much that a term was invented to describe the party that they would have. It was a week-long kind of drinking fest, and it was called a mischief, right? And, and that's exactly what it was. It was a week long of just drinking. And so they had these, and they were known for these things. And so what's interesting here is, is Samson's coming, right? They're having this wedding ceremony, and Samson is throwing this type of feast, right? Right? The guy who has dedicated his, his life to be separated, right, from anyone else, right, separated just for God and his purposes. Now he is the one who is throwing a party with and for the Philistines, a week-long drinking celebration to commemorate his marriage. Remember, he's taken a Nazarite vow. For those of you, maybe you don't know, you weren't here last week. A Nazarite vow means that that really uh, one of the things that you did, and it, it was for most people, it was just for a short time. But for Samson, he dedicated his entire life to keeping this vow to God. And the first thing that you did, you did not eat or drink of anything of the vine, right? So no alcohol whatsoever. He wasn't even supposed to be around it. He said, God, I will, I will abstain from this. My entire life I'll do this and so here we find that the guy right that has said made this vow to God and keep it for all of his life that he'd be dedicating use for God he's throwing a week-long drinking fest for the Philistines and for all that gather to celebrate this wedding the fiesta is accompanied by 30 notice this what the Bible says companions They would be friends of the groom. But here's what's interesting. They're provided by the bride's family. In other words, these aren't like Samson's friends, right? These aren't his childhood buddies. They didn't come from Israel going over into the enemy territory. They didn't go into Philistine, right? He goes over there in the Philistine and his father-in-law and mother-in-law brings in 30 companions, 30 men from Philistine, right? And they bring them in and they are there to celebrate as part of the wedding party. Temptation often comes, right, when we choose the wrong friends. A lot of times we're at the wrong place, the wrong time, with the wrong people, and what happens, it always leads to the wrong things, right? And here we find that Samson has put himself in a position where he shouldn't be. And now these people are brought in. The wrong people are surrounding him in life. And temptation is going to come. And it came his way. As we know just through for the like 11 verses of all we know about Samson. If you were to ask us what do we know about him. We can already say this. He consistently chooses to be a wrong among the wrong people. Over and over again. First was the Philistine girl. Now it's these companions. You know, the Bible warns us of this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, it teaches us, Be not deceived. Bad company does what? Ruins good morals. The Bible speaks to it. And here's why. Because we usually end up going in the same direction as the people that we hang around. And this is where we see Samson, right? They don't don't act this way. They don't live this type of lifestyle, right? The Israelites are not known for this behavior. And yet here we find that not only is Samson in the middle of it, man, he's the life of the party. He's the host. He's the one throwing this shindig, right? He's fallen victim. He's fallen to the trap. And we got to be careful not to as well. Listen, if 
People, you know, uh, single, if you're here today and you're single and you're looking for a mate, right? I mean, Samson's a great example of the look. Say, hey, avoid these mistakes. Avoid doing these things. That's why it's here, right? It's to show you what not to do. And, and in here, we see that Samson did a lot of bad things, right? First of all, he goes to a place he never should have went to and he finds her there. Uh, a lot of times, right, we, instead of, think about this, instead of inviting someone maybe for dinner, maybe a movie, how about this, why not suggest church in a movie? When I suggest, hey, why don't we meet and go to church together, and after that, we'll go catch a movie, or we'll go catch dinner afterwards. Why do you say that? Well, that'll narrow down the field a little bit, right? It will. If they don't want to go to church, then hey, that, that, that's it, man. Don't, don't, don't even fool with it, right? If you are a believer, don't do that. That was Samson's first mistake, and everything rolls downhill from there. Don't make the same mistakes. What happens, I think, sometimes is that we fear, right? Many people fear being single more than they fear the Lord, and so what happens is we do like something, we begin to rationalize in our mind. Well, hey, this is okay, right? Listen, we see right here in his lives, this is not what we want to do. Don't get involved with someone that's a non-believer. You want to know why? Because you'll end up like Samson trying to be married to a non-believer. He made a bad decision and he acts on it. And this happens far, far too often. And I always say, right, and even with my own uh, children, right, it, it'll be this, listen, it's okay to, to, to date someone that's a non-believer. Invite them to go to church. If they come to church, that's fantastic. That's a win. That's what it's all about. But if you are trying to be friends, if you're trying to uh, uh, become close to someone, if you're trying to uh, uh, know someone uh, romantically, right, that you may think, hey, I would like to spend my, my life and my future with them. Listen, if they do not go to church, even if they're not a believer, when they say, hey, I, I, I'm just, I can't go there, I can't go, you have to cut it off. You have to. Because here's what happens. More too, or far too often, that same couple reaches out and they're not happy in their marriage before too long. And you want to know what the first thing you hear? Well, he's not a Christian. Or she's not a Christian. And it's like, yeah, but, but you knew that walking in. And that doesn't mean every time. Let me say this. Hey, when my parents married, they've been married 54 years. My mom wasn't a believer. But she would go to church. And she would go every week. And by the grace of God, one day, she received the gospel and believed it, right? So listen, there's times if they're willing to go, if they're willing to listen, if they're willing to hear, then, then, then hey, praise God, Right? But if they're not and they want nothing about it, you need to do nothing about it either. Do not pursue it. And here we find just case in point with Samson's life. He's in the wrong place at the wrong time. He meets the wrong person and now they've surrounded him with other wrong people and he's going down the wrong path, not the path that God set for his life. Let's not make the same mistakes. It's a trap and it's something that believers, Christians, should and can avoid. And some people say, well, you know what? Hey, it's not a sin. Well, as once heard before, <laughs> eating the cereal box instead of your cereal is not a sin either. It's just dumb, right? <laughs> and listen, if you love Jesus and you're trying to pursue him and you want to dedicate your life and your marriage and your family and your, and your, your life to him, start out on the right foot, right? Start out on the correct path. I heard uh, literally coming to church this morning as we were driving here, I heard a statistic that said 50, that, that men and women, that married couples, right, that are active in their church is 57% less likely to divorce than non-believing couples. That is a huge statistic, right? Be sure that you are equally yoked. So here's Samson. It's his second violation of this vow that he's dedicated to the Lord. Last week we learned that, that part of the vow, there's only three things, right? It's like, hey, don't cut your hair. 
don't uh, uh, drink, consume alcohol. And then the third thing is don't touch anything dead. And within the first 11 verses that we learn about Samson, he's broken two of these vows, right? He, last week he touched a, a, a dead lion and now he's surrounding himself. He's the life of the party. So it, it, two parts of the vow, he's already broken. Spiritual breakdowns can always be traced to little things. Little things. Little decisions that, guess what? Turn into big things. Small compromises turn into big sins. Nobody, and I mean nobody, loses control of their life to Satan overnight. It just doesn't happen. It's a gradual process of deception. It's a gradual process of, of yielding to his shrewd influences on our life. And that's what happened with Samson. It was the little decisions, the little compromises that he decided, well, it's just one time, right? Just one time. Or you only, you only get married once, God. Come on, right? The little compromises that he made turned into huge sins, and I say that because there's no telling in mine, in your life, whatever bad habit we have, whatever wrong behaviors we take part in, or unhealthy patterns in our life, it's no telling what they could cost us if we don't stop. So what compromises are we making in our life today? What are they? So Samson's in the middle of this party. And look what happens in verse number 12, where we pick back up. And Samson said to them, let me now put a riddle to you. If you can tell me what it is within the seven days of the feast and find out, then I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. But if you can't tell me what it is, then you shall give me 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. And they said to him, put your riddle that we may hear it. Now, he says to them, out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. And in three days, they could not solve the riddle. All right. We uh, picture here that Samson, right, he, he's in the middle of the party, the life of it, and all of a sudden he comes up with this bright idea. He becomes the Riddler all of a sudden. And he's going to challenge these men, these Philistine men that are here at the party. He sound, he's like, uh, I've got a riddle for you. And uh, he, he says, you know what, here's the thing. If you can't... Uh, uh, figure it out within seven days, I'll give every one of you a suit of clothes. But if you can't figure it out, then all of you owe me a suit of clothes as well. So he makes this wager, right? 30 garments, 30 sets of festival garments to the winner. So think about this. We, we've seen him now break his second vow. He's at the life of the party. Now he's making wagers. Next thing you know, he's going down, getting a cash advance, sitting at the blackjack table, right? I mean, it's downhill, right? We can see. This was not a wise decision that he's making here. And so he gives this riddle. Now, think about this. We hear it, he says, out of the eater came something to eat. And out of the strong came something sweet. He knows that solving the riddle requires that you would have to have a certain knowledge of him having taken the honey from the lion that he had killed. Only Samson and God knew the answer, right? Only the Lord knows he's done this. Remember, he didn't even tell his parents he was away from them, so only God and Samson knew the answer to this riddle. But here's what I want us to really pay attention to. Notice Samson wasn't ashamed of what he had done. Remember, 
Samson's not supposed to touch anything dead. When he goes back to see the lion that he killed with his bare hands, inside of the lion is a swarm of bees and they have this, this honeycomb, right? And he's not supposed to be anywhere near this dead body, but he once for a handful of honey, he goes over and he breaks his vow with God and he touches something that is dead and it would defile him in the eyes of God. And yet, in a, something that you would think he would be remorseful about, in something that you would think that, hey, this would be maybe a shameful thing for him to know that he did this in such a manner. We learn right here, Samson's not ashamed or remorseful or repentant of at all. In fact, he's proud of what he's done. And so he comes up with this riddle because he's proud of this accomplishment. He's not afraid of what he's done. You know, pride leads to imprisonment. And here we're going to find, right? If you think about this, what, what do you see? What do you find in prison? You find relational death. You find emotional death, spiritual death. There could be, in some cases, even physical death, right? And all these things, this pride, this, this way of life that Samson, this path that he's going down, it's going to lead to all of those things, relationally, emotionally, spiritually, and even physically, death. Because he's made continuously in his life small compromises that turned into big things in his life. Small compromises that turned into big sins. He's not repentant about what he's done. He's not sorry. In fact, he's proud of his accomplishments. You know, when we repent, you know what that does? It's saying that, hey, I recognize that first and foremost, right? My sin is against God. We learn this from David, who God said was a man after his own heart. And guess what? After David committed adultery with another man's wife, after David ha had that woman's husband killed in battle, when his sin was found out, this is what he said in Psalms chapter 51, verse 4. He said, against you and you only have I sinned and done what was evil in your sight. He realized that the heart that he broke the most was the Lord's heart. And it changed him. And he was repentant and he was remorseful. He knew he broke God's heart and it broke his and yet we find here in Samson, we don't find any remorse. Instead, we find a, a sense of pride of what is done. And so he gives them this riddle. And this is the interesting thing. Do you notice how long he gives them to solve it? He gives them seven days. Like not minutes, but days, right? Let's just say he's not helping the cause and the stigma that comes with being a jock, right? <laughs> Why didn't he just say, hey, I'll give you an hour to figure this out? No, he gives them seven days. And so while this feast is going on, they're trying to figure it out. And so look what happens in verse 15. And on the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, entice your husband to tell us what the riddle is, lest we burn you in your father's house with fire. Have you invited us here to impoverish us? And Samson's wife wept over him and said, you only hate me, you do not love me. You put a riddle to my people and you have not told me what it is. And he said to her, behold, I have not told my father or my mother. And shall I tell you? And she wept before him seven days that their feast lasted. And on the seventh day, he told her because she pressed him hard. And then she told the riddle to her people and the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion? And he said to them, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not, you would not have found out my riddle. All right. <laughs> it's hard to come back from that line, right? 
We'll talk about that in a second. But uh, I kind of label this a, a crack in the armor. And he, here's why I say that. Um, they're trying to figure out the riddle. They're three days into this now, and they have no idea. And they wouldn't, because why? Only Samson and God know about it. Only they know the answer. No one else was around. And so after three days, they're unable to solve it. The, the, the Philistine men, they get the bride-to-be, and they say, hey, you're, you're making a mockery out of us. You're a part of this scheme. If you don't get the answer, if you don't give it to us, we're going to burn you and your father's house to the ground. And so they go to his bride and they threaten her. And I say this because we're going to learn in Samson's life, that's the crack in his armor. For him, it was the opposite sex. The enemy knows where to attack you. He knows where to hit you. Listen, you don't think he does? Then, then think again. Look at scripture, right? Uh, when he went up before the Lord, when God uh, w- uh, called the angels and, and Satan comes up and he's like, what are you doing here? You know what he says? He says, I've been going to and fro in all the earth. And I've searched your servant Job. There's none like him. He searches the hearts of men and women. He he tries to analyze it. He knows where he can attack you. He knows your weaknesses. When Jesus went out into the wilderness, when he came to him, what did he come to him with? He came to him about his hunger. He knew that he was hungry. He knew what his weakness was in that moment. But Jesus overcame. And we can too. With God's help, with God's, the Holy Spirit in our life, we can do it. But the enemy hit Samson where they knew they could affect him. And they went to his bride, applied she was part of the scheme. And so what does she do? She goes to Samson and she asked for the answer. She said, hey, this is embarrassing. You need to tell me. He's like, you, you, you don't love me. And I, I thought it was interesting here. I don't know if you caught, caught this, but notice what she says to him. She says, you have put a riddle to who? To my people. To my people. Case in point, right, of what we were learning about the past two weeks now. He is an Israelite. He has been set aside, right, the children of Israel, as God's people, the apple of his eye. That is him. And she sees him as that. And she sees her people and the Philistines as her people, right? She says, they are my people. And so she comes to him. And she tries to get the answer. And he comes back with something very interesting. He says, hey, you know what? I ain't even even told my mom or my dad. Why should I tell you? Again, this marriage, right, was doomed from the start. And this right here, this conversation is a fantastic piece just to verify every bit of that. Because see, when you come together and you are believers and you're followers of Jesus, and when you come together hand in hand for marriage, you know the first thing that you learn about that God teaches us? That new believers, they come together and one in marriage, you learn to leave, you learn to cleave, and you learn to become one. You leave your father and your mother, and you cleave to your wife, and you become one. And when you look at the exchange that happens there, there's nothing about that that describes a godly marriage. Nothing. He's like, hey, I haven't told my mom and dad. Why should I tell you? Well, you're getting married, right? (laughs) Two become one. She's your wife. So she's like, hey, you're lying to me. You don't love me. I mean, she's hitting him hard, right? (laughs) <laughs> she's letting him know. She's like, how can you say we're starting our marriage off with secrets? And he's withstood it as long as he can. And this goes on for days, another four days. And finally she pulls out the secret weapon. She pulls out the pouty face. You know <laughs> And Samson's saying as long as he can, not the pouty face. And at that moment, he tells her the answer to the riddle. And she turns and she goes to her people. And she goes to the 30 command, uh, companions where he had made the wager with. And she tells him the answer. 
And so sure enough, they wait till the sun is almost about to set, right to the minute. Remember now, we know this about Samson, right? He's got a little bit of pride in his heart. Could you imagine as the sun's getting ready to set, he knew, he thought he had them whipped, right? And all of a sudden, in they come. And they present to him the answer, the correct answer. And he knows immediately what has happened. And let's just say that um, Samson has a way with words, right? Um, he knows what has happened. And he basically says, hey, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. He knows that they used his wife to get to him, right? Men, don't try that at home. <laughs> all right, not a good thing. Do, do not do that. Uh, not very flattering at all the way uh, th that he was talking, right? But um, here we find the enemy knew how to attack Samson, and guess what? It worked. They knew where the cracks were in his life, and guess what? That's exactly what they went after. And the enemy knows the cracks in our life. And he comes right after that. And that's where he will attack again and again and again. That's why Paul, when he wrote in Ephesus, right, he talked about putting on what? The whole armor of God from head to toe. He said we need every piece of it every single day in order to protect us from the enemy. Now look what happens next. The riddle is out. Samson owes these people a lot of clothes. And in verse 19, the Bible says this, And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. And he went down to Ascalon, and he struck down 30 men of the town, and he took their spoil, and he gave the garments to those who had told the riddle. And in hot anger, he went back to his father's house, and Samson's wife was given to his companion, who had been his best man. Sounds like a soap opera, doesn't it? You know, only the Lord can turn a mess into a message of some type. And right when you think this is horrible, he's been made a, a fool, he, he's somewhere he shouldn't be, he's with people he shouldn't be with, he's doing things he should not do, and you see this just continually, right? This, he just continually just gets further and further and further from God, like he's fallen away. And all of a sudden, in verse 19, we see this picture of just grace comes upon his life. It said, the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. God overruled Samson's foolishness by enabling him with a power to accomplish his purpose in disrupting the Philistines' really easy domination that they had had over the people of Israel. And the Lord is basically going to use Samson's folly for Israel's favor, right? As only God can do. Because to fulfill this wagers, right, this obligation to it, he goes down to a local village there of the Philistines. And, and he goes in and he basically picks a fight with all of them and he kills all the men until he gets enough changes of clothes to meet his obligation that he's made and what is owed. And then he takes their clothes with him and he's back off. Back off to the wedding feast. You might say, why would God fill Samson with his spirit to do something so vindictive? Israel's been in captivity. Remember I said earlier, like apple of God's eye. They're his chosen people. They're set apart. Nobody else worships Yahweh. No one else recognizes Yahweh. Everybody does what's right and worships whoever they want, right? Israel should recognize that, hey, we serve the one and only true God, right? And, and so the Philistines for, for years now have been robbing them relationally, spiritually, emotionally, financially, physically. When anything good comes in the land, guess what? The Philistines come and they take it. And the problem is, is now that the children of Israel are so used to this, they're getting accompanied to it. They're not even crying out for deliverance anymore. And so the Lord says, you know what? I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to stir up the pot. I'm going to 
defend my people. I'm going to get rid of their complacency, right? And so he is going to use Samson to stir up and attack the enemy. He's going to deal a blow to them that they did not see coming. And only the Lord can do. I say that because this, even Jesus said, you know what? The enemy comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I've come that you might have life. In every one of our lives right now, there is an evil enemy, a spiritual enemy, the enemies of God, and listen what they desire to do in your life, just like they did in Samson's life. They want to kill, they want to kill or steal, and they want to destroy you. Everything about your life, your relationship with God, they want to kill it. They want to destroy it. Your eternity, they want to destroy it, right? Right? They want nothing good for you. And so now we see that the Lord steps on the scene in mercy and in grace, and he empowers a sinful man. He empowers Samson, and Samson goes on a rage. And this complacency and, and, that have arisen in Israel's hearts, and this pride that is in the Philistines' hearts that they dominate the people of God and can use them and make them as slaves and whatever, and they don't have to recognize this God of Israel that they believe in, suddenly he shows up and he shows out. And 30 men of the village of the town are killed by one man with his bare hands. And God has empowered him. And he comes back, and God's going to use this for a bigger purpose. He's going to create a division, right? Remember, there's complacency on both sides. And now, for the first time in a long time, there's no complacency anymore. The Philistines have been attacked. A decisive battle. A whole the village has, has been wiped away through one man, through Samson. And so God has used... This man's folly, his, his sin, his mistakes. Somehow through God's grace, he's able to use that for his glory and his own purposes. And he does it. And now here's where it gets interesting. The Bible tells us this. And then if you notice something, in verse 19, there's a period. In other words, there's a stop, right? Samson goes and he gives the clothing to who he made the, the riddle with, the wager with, and then it stops. And then notice this. In hot anger, he went back to his father's house. It's almost like a, a great distinction's made, right? Hey, the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon Samson. He goes and he does this thing uh, through the Spirit of God. And, he, and, he, and then all of a sudden it stops. And then the next thing you read, in hot anger, he goes back to his father's home. This is Samson's flesh. The anger. You know what anger is? It's that intense feeling that w we all get, right? In the spot response, when someone hurts us, when someone frustrates us, right? When we feel threatened, when we get disappointed, we get what? We get angry. And, and Samson here, he is angry. And, and maybe the, the, the most intense, destructive, and unhealthy emotion that any of us have, guess what? It's anger. And he wasn't just angry, he was in hot anger, right? That, that's like a couple notches up, I'm assuming. He is hot, he is angry. And you know, when we get angry and we get hot and we get mad, we can make some horrible decisions in that state. And if it's not handled in the proper way, it could have drastic life-changing consequences. And, and yes, listen, there's a type of anger that, that God is okay with. There's like a biblical anger, right? It looks a lot like you and me not being angry, though. It's not, it's not that. And it's certainly not uh, this anger that is here that Samson's doing. The thing about anger is that sometimes it numbs us emotionally. We don't think straight. And that's what's going on here. Do you know how many relationships throughout the history of time have disintegrated because anger was not dealt with? And you could add one more to the list right here with Samson. Did you see what happened? He went back to his father's house, not back to his bride. Think about this. This was the seventh day. This is the last day of the celebration. This was the, the night, the big night, right? 
He, he's got to consummate the marriage. He's got to take his bride to become one. They live together, right? Supposedly happily ever after. But what does not, Samson not do? He does not go and get his bride. He walks away. He goes back to his mother and back to his father in hot anger. And the father-in-law, he gave his daughter to the best man in an attempt to avoid disgrace of what everybody perceived as an annulment, he takes her and gives her to the best man. Again, this is like soap opera stuff, right? But it's, it, it's reality. All of this, this whole train wreck that we're reading about and learning about goes back to spiritual breakdowns. Little decisions. Little compromises. Little rationalizations, right? Can be traced back to little things that turn into big things. And that's what we see here in this story. Small compromises that Samson make turns into big sins. What compromises are we making in our life? When we hear this story... Maybe it's not relationally, maybe it's something else, but what is the Holy Spirit showing us in our life are, are we doing? What compromises are we making? Is it with our kids? Is it with work? Is it with taxes, right? Well, it's just this one. I'll do it this one year. I'm going to say this this one year, not next year. Next thing you know, you're doing it every year. Small compromises lead to big sins. It's time to come clean. Say, God, I know you're speaking to me today and I want to get right with you. Samson could have been one of the greatest leaders in the history of Israel, but you know what? Instead, his life became an example of not how to live his life was characterized by squandered resources, wasted potential, wasted ability. He threw it all away as a result of making some subtle but really serious mistakes. But here's the amazing thing. Although his life stands before us as a warning today, it's also a story of second chances. And we're going to see that throughout his life and throughout the next couple of weeks. And if you're here today and you say, hey, you know, I made some bad choices. Or maybe you're here today and you say, you know, hey, I, I know what that's like. I've been in the wrong place at the wrong time. I've been, I've surrounded myself with the wrong people. Hey, I've been there. I've been the life of that party that Samson was leading. Why don't you come home today? Why don't you come back to the Lord? Or why don't you come to the Lord for the first time and say, hey, you know what? I'm like, that doesn't lead to happiness. That never gave me satisfaction. That never brought me the joy that I was looking for. It can only be found in a relationship today with Jesus Christ. You need him to protect you, to keep the enemy away. Many of us, we feel defeated. We feel we've been robbed. We feel dead inside. That's why Jesus said the enemy would do. It's not God that makes you feel that way. It's the lack of God in your life that makes you feel that way. Jesus said, there's good news. I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Today, Christ can give you life. He can help you. He can meet your greatest need. He hears the greatest cry of your soul. And he's able to meet it. Today, I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to pray together. Jesus, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Lord, for this incredible story of this incredible man who is just like us. Lord, I pray that you would use his story to help us, to warn us, to guide us, Lord. To help us see the mistakes that we make. To help us learn how to respond to them, Lord. To not be prideful about them. But to look back and be remorseful, Lord. Be repentant. Let us realize today, Lord, that the choices we make, the, the sins that we commit, 
first and foremost, they're, they're, they're against you, Lord. And Lord, we repent of those sins. And Lord, if there's anybody that's here today that doesn't have a relationship with you, Jesus, they've just been trying to find a peace, a joy, a satisfaction in the things of this world, whether it's in relationships and finances and spirituality, Lord, you name it, they've looked for it, they've searched for it there, and they've yet to find it. Today, I pray is the first day that they realize what they've been looking for the whole time was you. So Jesus, speak to their heart. Let them know that you can feel it. Doesn't matter what they've done, doesn't matter the choices that were made, what you did on the cross covers it all, forgives it all. Lord, meet us with grace like you met Samson. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Today, if you'd like to come and pray, we'll pray with you. We'll help you. Just be obedient to hearing God's voice in your life.
after us even when we go. But we shouldn't go with the people we shouldn't be with and do the things we shouldn't do. And I pray you would just be with us all. Carry us through our week. Help us to be your love. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We love you all.